Is there a person, a stranger whom you met once in your life and never met since and are likely to never meet again that you occasionally think of? If so, why? Story one. Today, actually. My son was born on Thursday night and we didn't buy any preemie sized diapers for when we get him home. So I went to Target to get some diapers well ahead of them being released from the hospital. Anyway, I'm in the diaper aisle and I'm also looking for anything to help making feeding easier for my wife. And there's a man, almost in tears, just blankly staring and obviously not having an idea of what he needs to buy. I commented to him about how old his child was. It's obvious he's a new dad like I am. And he lost it. To me, a complete stranger. I found out his wife had a stroke during labor and had passed from complications and he was raising his daughter on his own and she's only eight days old and coming home tomorrow. His wife's mother is on him to make sure he gets the best formula since he can't ball feed. I used the same technique to keep my wife calm in the hospital and had him breathe slowly and regain composure. He said his daughter was his wife's dream come true, and she had made a lot of the plans for child rearing, and he's completely lost on what to do for his newborn daughter. He was a mess all around, but he told me he's an architect in the SF Bay Area, but will be telecommuting now that he's the sole provider for his daughter's needs. I told him, your mother-in-law has no choice in the matter for formula since you're the one there, and we went over all of the labels for each and used our phones to review, and I called my wife's lactation specialist to get tips, and we eventually chose the right things for his daughter based on her size and his abilities. I got him in touch with some groups to help him with these decisions in everything, and even had him install Alien Blue so that he can search some of the groups for parents on Reddit. He was crying in the parking lot because he was attempting to install the car seat in the car and was distraught, so I called a CHP. They are certified to verify proper installation her in CA. Friend of mine who was going to meet him at the hospital where his daughter is and make sure it's installed properly since he was free and lives literally three blocks from the hospital. He was a pretty normal guy and seemed so out of place crying, but his emotions have gone from highest of highs to lowest of lows in a matter of seconds. I would never expect to see him again, but I'm sure his daughter, Sophia Lauren, her mom loves Sophia Lorin, will have a great life, and he will be beside himself, but he's going to be just fine. Story two, when my parents were poor and we had to live with other people. We moved in with this Hispanic family who rarely spoke English, but their daughter was learning it. I was two years, maybe one year younger than her. My parents kept me in the room. I never came out to see the people who was nice enough to let us stay with them. One time my mom was washing dishes, I decided to come out my room around the same time their daughter did, and she spoke broken English, and I understood a little of what she was saying, and this is when the Dexter's Laboratory toys came out in McDonald's. I had the little rolling Dexter toy, and she had the DD toy, and we played for a good 25 minutes. My mom told me to go back in the room, and we said bye, and I never saw her again. Story 3 Going to bend the rules here because it was more than once I met her. So there I was at the local watering hole. My buddy was being a bit of a downer because our other buddy ditched us that night. Sitting in the booth, I say, you need to lighten up. He ditched us to hang out with a girl, so what? He starts his little speech. I cut him off. No, you need to be more like this girl, gestures to girl next booth over who's dancing to the music, and have fun. Well, of course she noticed me gesturing at her. We made eye contact and had a few seconds of cross-table dancing. The night goes on. We're in the same watering hole still, and I decide to get myself another beer. I run into the girl again. We flirt. Turns out she does ballet and thinks it's cool eye ballroom. I dip her a few times. Bar closes, life goes on. Two days later, I'm at the library, and I'm looking over at this girl thinking to myself, that has to be her. Foolishly, I don't bother to find out. That Wednesday was my friend's 21st, so naturally we all go out to have a good time. While leaving one bar for the next guess who I run into. Yep, there she was again. This time we chat for a second. I'm on my way out. She's on her way in. Turns out it was her from the library. It is at this moment I realize how big of a mistake I made. I noticed her noticing me, and I didn't put her on notice. At that, I noticed her too. We part ways. I, about a week later, I'm walking down the street heading home. And there she is again, getting on her bike and rides slowly past me. We notice each other. She's looking over her shoulder. I turn around and start walking toward her. I stop. She keeps riding. That's how she got away. Story four. When I was 16, I went on a tour bus trip from Chicago to Louisville, Kentucky. Somewhere in part of Indiana, after you start seeing signs referring to Kentuckiana, we stopped to get food and take a break. With about 10 minutes left, I went into Burger King to order a chocolate shake. I paid the cashier and stood in line to wait. The people after me order like five trays worth of food, so all the staff were running around. 
Someone poured my shake and left it under the shake machine. I wait a few minutes and my friend comes in yelling, TLP, the bus is leaving. We have to go. And I tell her how I'm still waiting. The friend went out. A young man, obviously local from his accent, comes up to me and asks what's wrong. I say they haven't given me the shake I paid for. He goes behind the counter and grabs it for me. I thank him and he goes, you have a good day, ma'am. I'll never forget that guy. Story five. Shortly after my husband and I got married, I saw a picture of his sister when she was a baby. It reminded me of this story. When I was in middle school, my mom, sister, and I went to our local IHOP after church. As we were coming in, a family was gathering their things to leave. This family was a mother, a little girl that looked like my SEIL, and a boy that was my age. We sat down at the table next to this family, and as I sat, the boy and I just looked at each other. It was weird, as if the whole world disappeared around us. Then the family left, and the spell was broken. I would think of that boy all the time and the weird connection we had. As I told my husband that story, he told me, That was me. He was that boy, and he remembered me. Story six. I watched a small truck hit a motorcycle on my 21st birthday. It threw the couple from the bike. The guy passed away instantly, but his wife rolled to a stop directly in front of my vehicle. I was the first one to her. She didn't respond at first, and I reached for her palm, touching it softly. Immediately, she came to and moaned. I held her hand until paramedics arrived and they moved me aside. She made it. They had six children, I found out, from the local news station. I still think about how she's doing every year on my birthday. That was eight years ago soon. Edit, the guy that hit them was drunk at 2.30 in the afternoon. He was driving a small pickup with the back end full of chopped wood. He didn't see them slow to turn and hit them going 55. It's a miracle the woman made it. Both were wearing helmets, but the man hit the pavement face first with enough force that he passed away instantly. She bounced and rolled several feet. Nothing will ever enforce the need for a DD at 21 years more than witnessing something like this firsthand. Edit. Wow, my highest rated comment is this. Somehow I'm not surprised, though. I just hope people learns to get designated drivers and to watch for bikes. Story 7. When I was in Victoria, British Columbia, on vacation with my family, seven or eight years ago, I was walking around somewhere downtown late at night, probably eleven or twelve. I saw a homeless man desperately trying to get people's attention, but everyone kept rushing past him without a second glance. As I was walking by, honestly, with the full intention of just passing him, I caught a bit of what he was saying and realized he was in pain. Pausing and listening to him, I realized he was having heart problems and really needed help. I ducked into the bar we were next to and borrowed a cell phone to call an ambulance and got some water and aspirin for him. All I really knew about heart attacks was that aspirin was supposed to help. I sat with him until the ambulance came, during which multiple other homeless men came up to me and thanked me for actually helping him. When the paramedics finally got there, they checked him out and got him ready to go to the hospital. But before they left, they told me that I had probably saved his life. I still remember his face and often think of what he is doing now. Story 8. I was walking to the store one day. I lived in Milwaukee, Oregon at the time. It was an unnaturally hot day that day, so I bought a soda for 50 cents off some kids I had passed that had a sort of lemonade stand up. It's a long walk to the store, so I walked and walked and walked. At some point, I saw someone ahead of me walking my direction. She was a very pretty girl wearing jeans and a red black plaid shirt over a black shirt with what I think was a band logo on it. She came closer and closer to me, and I swear to God I knew her from somewhere. She looked so familiar she and I could have been friends for years. I don't know how I knew, but I knew that I knew her. I don't know how, I just know that I knew this girl. I didn't want to appear to be a creeper, so I just walked on by her. After about five or six yards, I couldn't stand it anymore, so I stopped and turned around to look at her, and she had stopped and was looking at me as well. We sort of both raised our hands and pointed at each other and said at the same time, I know you. We stepped closer to each other and tried to figure out how we knew each other. We went back to our childhoods trying to figure out how we knew each other. She had lived in another state, and I had lived in another state, but not the same state. She had just moved here from her state, and I had been here for years now. It seemed there was no point in our lives that our paths would have crossed, but we had such an intense connection we just couldn't figure out. We stood there talking for some time, shared my soda, laughed, and finally parted ways. I still think about her quite a bit. Still have no clue who she is or how I knew her, only that I did feel as if I very much knew her. We joked that maybe we were each other's soulmates, and seriously, I felt as though the connection were strong enough that it could have been the case. I'll never know, and I still think of her from time to time. Story 9. 
When I was 13, I was in Chicago with my cousin, and we were a bit high. We were walking around the upper part of the city, not really sure where as I was, 13 and high. Anyway, I tripped, stumbled, and almost got hit by a truck. A lady pulled me back from the road, dropping a bag of groceries process. I thanked her and offered to pay for the milk that got busted when she dropped the food. She told me it was fine. She said her husband was a senator and she had the money to buy some more milk and that I should be more careful walking around in my state and gave me a look like, I know you're high as cow. And I helped her pick up the groceries of the ground and, and when went on her way. Never thought of her again until I was watching a presidential debate or something around two years later and standing behind one of the candidates was the lady who saved at least my body from injury. Turns out she was Michelle Obama. Didn't mean anything to me at the time, so I thought nothing of it until I saw her again and her husband was running for president. Edit. Since this is getting a nonsense ton of attention is like to add, I sent her a thank you letter in 08 after she became first lady, but with him being so busy, I never got a response. Also, in case anyone was wondering how she did it, she caught the hood of my hoodie and yanked me back by it. I wasn't fully off the sidewalk yet, so I just kind of fell back onto the sidewalk. I'm doing my best to respond to replies that are something other than, I want to believe or similar stuff. I responded to the first one I IRC, but now my inbox is full of I want to believe, and it's okay, I believe you, and over 9,000 similar statements. Story 10. First off, a little bit of backstory. I was kidnapped by my grandparents when I was younger, raised in religious cult, where I was kept away from all media, except the news, which was on CNN almost all day, 24 sevenths, homeschooled and sheltered away from books, music, etc., one day their grip slipped and I met a girl. We ran away together. Girl moved Oregon via plane. I followed with on bus. Somewhere on the trip across the states via Greyhound, I met this other girl who was also running away. It's been over a decade, so details are a little foggy, but I remember something about her CD player dying, so I let her use mine. It was an awkward bonding at first, as any single serving friendship is. We played skee-ball or some sort of arcade game at a bus stop, and we ended up talking for hours about where we came from, where we wanted to go in life, etc. Also, the creepy guy sitting behind us kind of butted in and started injecting himself into our conversation. I remember clearly him talking about being a 30-something lawyer on his way to meet his 18-YO girlfriend. Either way, for someone just recently exposed to the outside world, this was both terrifying and exhilarating. Then night came as we were driving through a snow-ridden part of the States. We were cold, holding hands and cuddling on the bus. She looked up and kissed me. Her stop came up, Portland. She then told me her real name wasn't Courtney Love. How the hell was I supposed to know? I wasn't allowed to listen to music, and that she hoped we both found what we were looking for in life. To this day, I sometimes drift off and think about what would have happened if I just said fudge it and got off there in PDX with her. Those kinds of moments don't really happen anymore in life because you can't have one conversation with someone without them adding you to Facebook. Story 11. I was in the hospital. I have anxiety problems, and this was the first time they had gotten so bad. It felt like my heart was torn and bleeding. I found out later these were just anxiety-caused chest pains, but I had never felt anything like it before, and I'd never been in the emergency before, so I was pretty freaked out. An old woman was sitting next to me. At one point, she put her hand on my shoulder and in an Eastern European accent said, You're an artist. I can see it in your eyes. I am an artist. I have no idea how she knew. I guess I probably just looked like the type. She wasn't psychic or anything. But she was so old and so comforting. It was like she was saying, I've seen your shape before in another life. Everything's going to be okay. I was still nervous, but not quite as much. I'll never forget her. Story 12. About four years ago, I was at a huge house party thrown by a band I liked at the time. All of my close friends were there. And of course, like most parties thrown by bands, we all eventually congregated in the living room to drunkenly sing songs while the boys played along on their guitars. It was everything 21-year-old me loved. At some point, I was sitting on the floor, and a guy I didn't know sat down next to me. He offered me some candy and a drink, and we started talking. He seemed nice enough, although very self-deprecating. I made some comment about how he needed to think more highly of himself. I'm sure drunken stone 21-year me wasn't very classy and just yelled words that sounded consoling. He stopped, nodded, and then asked if he could tell me a story. Hey, drunk 21-year-old me loves stories. Sure. He then told me about his life. He had a serious addiction to candy and candy, had struggled with eating disorders, and had been sixily and physically abused his entire life. He said it all matter-of-factly as if he had made his peace with who he was. I didn't know what to say or do. 21-year-old me came to party. 
so what do I do with this? I gave him a hug, and we continued to sit in silence for a couple of hours, him holding my hand. At some point, I needed to find a place to pass out. Classy me chose underneath a dining room table. He decided to come with me. He held me as we fell asleep, and he whispered the things he was afraid of in my ear. When I woke up, he was gone. I'm never going to see him again. I'm never going to be able to tell him the things I should have. So I'm saying it here. Stephen, you are a beautiful soul. You deserve so much more than what was given to you. I wish you saw yourself for who you are. You don't need to turn to sweets to seek peace. Find your passions, follow your dreams, seek love, seek happiness. You deserve all the happiness the world has to offer. I'm so sorry I couldn't be more to you. I'm sorry I couldn't help you. I'm so sorry. Story 13. A surfer named Dinah who saved me from drowning at the beach once. Edit. Sorry, I posted this brief comment since I didn't think a lot of people would read it, and I was pretty lazy, but here's the story. I was at the beach with my relatives, and I was just relaxing on my boogie board with my eyes closed so I didn't notice how far I was drifting from the shore until I tried to swim back. It was hard, and I panicked because I couldn't feel the sand anymore and the wave was bringing me down. I'm not a very good swimmer, but I did my best to keep my head up while swallowing mouthfuls of disgusting seawater. Fortunately, I have a loud, screaming voice, so I was yelling out help, and I heard someone say, I'll get this one. It was a guy coming to my rescue, and he told me to use the waves to get back. So when I had control of my boogie board, he pushed me back towards the beach. To calm me down, he had introduced himself as Dana. And it was weird, because that was the name of my teacher at that time. I never saw him again after that, but I wish I did. And I think he had shoulder-length hair. Thank you, Dana the Surfer. I owe you my life. Story 14. I was at the San Bernardino Renaissance Fair in 2002 and kept seeing this guy, slightly goth, but seemingly not douchey, and we kept making eye contact. There were thousands of people milling about, and we saw each other and made eye contact a half dozen times throughout the day. I had a so, so I didn't think to approach. I was one of the last people exiting at the end of the day, and I glanced around knowing I would see him. He walked up and said that I was beautiful. I honestly didn't believe him, just out of HS and still insecure. He pressed on and repeated himself. We asked a few questions of each other. I admitted I was taken. We lived far away, hundreds of miles, don't remember where, and said it was a shame we couldn't be friends. When I have an ugly day, I remember a cute stranger coming up to me. Not my friends with much more corseted cleavage and telling me I was beautiful. He has gotten me through many rough days, and I am very grateful. Story 15. In middle school, I dealt with lots of bullying, depression, and an eating disorder. So it was a tough time for me. I had seen this kid around on occasion, and one day I'm just sitting there waiting on my ride, and he starts talking to me. I don't remember a whole lot of what was said, just that he made an impression on me. He had this calm aura about him, and he was just the nicest kid I met there. I existed to him not to be made fun of, but to just be taken notice of for being a person. His name was Milo, and if I ever have a son, I'll probably name him after that kid. I never saw him after that. Story 16 a few years ago, my sister and I were shopping for school clothes at Target when this boy, probably around 12 or 13, and his mom walked by us. The kid picked up this women's jacket, held it against his chest, and told his mom, I like this one. His mom told him it was a lady's jacket, to which the kid responded, I know, but I look fierce in it. Without hesitation, the mom responded, You sure do. Put it in the cart. Our older brother wasn't exactly a stereotypical boy. And he and his flamboyant fashion choices were met with resistance from our family, so seeing this supportive mom just warmed our hearts. The kid has to be in high school by now, and I sometimes wonder how he's doing, and hope that he's still confidently fierce and that his mom still supports him. Story 17. I used to be really naive, coming coming from a small town and trusting people. I moved to a larger city, and there was a nice older man I met at a bus station. He befriends me quickly and then tells me a sob story about how he can't get home because he has a hold on his work check, and he asks to deposit it in my account. Long story short, he stole $300 of mine by using a fake check. I reported it, but nothing came back on him. Every time I'm short for cash at the end of the month, I think about the $300 I foolishly gave to a redneck hillbilly scam artist. It has changed my perception and trust of people ever since. Story 18 I was in the hospital as a kid for some surgery, more than 25 years ago. They brought in another kid to our shared room about my age, 10, 12, who was have a skin graft. He was from a small community I had never heard of in my province in Canada. He had been burned over most of his body a while before. 
His face was a mask of scarred and red skin. In my youthful brain, I could almost imagine that he was some sort of alien. This was how badly disfigured he was. He wasn't in any visible pain, and he appeared very happy and upbeat. He told me his story on how it happened. His house caught fire in the night, and his dog woke him up. But by that point, his was very badly burned. He managed to escape, but everyone else in his family passed away. I think I recall that he had no extended family left either. Everyone who met him was just so amazed. Here he was just a young kid who lost everything but his own life, and he still managed to find peace and happiness. I wonder what happened to him. Did he make it through all the recovery and surgeries that burns like that would require? Did he retain that happiness for life, despite all odds, that I had a chance to witness for those few days together that we were friends? Story 19. I was on a bus heading home and we stopped to pick people up. I was looking out when I noticed in my side vision a guy on the outside who couldn't seem to stop staring. I didn't look directly at him until he looked away, and when I did I realized he was telling his friends to look at me, so I looked away again before they saw I had noticed. The bus starts to pull away and he loses sight of me for a moment and is looking, so I decided to make eye contact and grin at him. He got the cutest, most surprised, and yet genuine smile on his face. I fell for him right there. Never saw him again and never will. Story 20. The night I was going to terminate myself, I went to McDonald's for my last meal. I bought a few cheeseburgers, and the guy behind the counter, Kevin, noticed my eyes were red from crying and asked if I was high. I said that I was thinking about terminating myself. He got me my food, watched me sit down, and came over next to me. We had a long talk, maybe 90 minutes or so. Kevin used to be to the sky and was in a psych ward for a long time. He helped me out of a dark place, and because of him, I'm here today. I still think about Kevin every now and again because he showed me that every person can be extraordinary. Story 21. When I was in the second grade, there was this boy named Michael. He didn't have many friends, if any at all, but he was always so sweet to me. I remember every day I had to walk across the backfield on my way to school, and even if he was already at the doors, he would run up to me and say, Good morning, Emma, and we would walk the rest of the way together. The other girls in my grade would tease me about it, and eventually I told Michael, Stop being so nice and so he stopped walking with me every morning. I feel awful about it still, even though I'm 20 now, but I'm sure Michael is still a good guy. I wish I could tell him how much I really enjoyed walking with him. Story 22. This probably will get buried, but a while ago, I was going through as tough of a patch that a super stupid and fortunate high schooler can go through. Family, relationship, athletics, and school. I didn't want any of my friends or family to know how down and poor I was feeling, so I kept it all bundled up to the point where I was beginning to have thoughts of ending my own life. I was taking myself out to a movie one night and was sitting on a bench waiting for the screen that the movie I was going into to open when a guy I'd never seen before walks up. He told me that he noticed a certain look on my face that he knew too well. He proceeded to tell me that the year before he had gone through severe depression and attempted side, but had picked up since. I remember his next words, clear as crystal. When cow starts going worse and worse, you have to realize that it won't be worth it to end it all. You have too much to live for, so go throw a fishing lure out and remember why you exist. He smiled and walked off. He must have known that I fish because I was wearing a Costa Del Mar t-shirt. The next day I took his advice and finally got out for the first time that year. It was the best day fishing I've had in my life, and what he said rung in my head. Here I am more than a year later realizing how stupid I was for letting myself get how I was. I still wish I knew how he could tell I was feeling so down just by looking at me. This is my first time ever telling this story to anyone at all. But there you have it. I owe a lot to this unnamed man. Story 23. I was on a train about two years ago on a visit to my hometown to see my girlfriend. I had moved about nine hours north and I rarely got to go visit. And this girl sits down, very disgruntled and asks me to use my phone because hers was stolen at the station. My girlfriend had happened to call me while she was on the phone, and she told me, Hey, call your girlfriend back. After I got off the phone, we started talking about where we were headed and such. She was another hour south of where I was going, and we began chatting it up. Turns out we were both in the same situation. Long-distance relationships, not being able to afford seeing the other very often. She gave me advice being that she was a bit older and her relationship had been going on for much longer. Before I got off the train, she said, told me, you're the coolest person I met on a train ever. Your girlfriend is very lucky. Be sure to invite me to the wedding one day. If you're a Redditor, Cassie, you're invited. It's next October and I've always taken your advice to heart. Story 24. When I was 13 or 14, I was having really bad issues at school and with my family. 
I'd always had problems with anxiety and depression, but things were just really bad. I felt like dirt and had for a long time, and I was just ready to end it all. I always hung out at this park that my house was by to get out of the house to avoid all of the problems that were going on, but never had much to do there since I was alone and didn't have any video games or anything. One day, there was a guy walking his dog who I'd seen a few times before, relatively small town, but never had any reason to speak to. I was so bored, though, that I decided to just tell him that he had a beautiful dog. He thanked me and I was just feeling happy about myself for being able to have some interaction with this total stranger without freaking out, somehow messing up, because simple social interactions made me bad person the fudge out. The dude walked away, but then came back and just sat down by me. He asked me basic questions about myself, what I liked to do, how old I was, what my favorite academic subject was, and eventually I just found myself completely opening up to this guy. Over the course of the next few months, I'd see him every once in a while, but we never spoke again. I don't know what made him decide to come and talk to me, but I just wish I could thank him because he saved me. If not for him, I would never have met my girlfriend or discover my love for video games, and I would have passed away far too young, afraid, and depressed. Story 25. I was sitting on the Sky Train and trying not to be noticed by anyone. As we pulled into a station, I looked through the glass on the other side of the car and made eye contact with a handsome guy sitting on the bench outside. He smiled at me, making me blush and look away. I raised my eyes again to see him still looking at me, softly smiling. I grin back at him, and the train lurches back into action. As it pulls away, he holds my gaze with his deep blue eyes. Just before he disappears from view, he waves, his smile now a little sad. My friend sitting next to me comments how she wonders what that guy was starring. It was a ridiculously powerful feeling connection. Only for seconds, but part of me wishes I had got off the train and talked to him. Story 26 when I was 17 or 18, I went to my usual breathe spot with a few friends one night. We were just sitting in my car and already pretty high when another car pulls up. It's a pretty common spot for people to come chill, drink, hook up, etc. We weren't too worried. Plus, it's Boulder, Colorado. I'd just finished loading a bowl when someone knocked on the passenger side window. We all screamed it was terrifying. But it was just a lady from the other car. We rolled down the window and she asked for a hit. I told her she was welcome to join us for the whole bowl, so she got in the car. I gave her the greens. She immediately began to tell a very long story about her cow day. That her BF broke up with her. That her former best friend said she was to the sky and called the cops on her as revenge for something. So she had spent the day being evaluated. When she finished her story, she asked if any of us had out medical card, and we told her no. Asked if she had one, and she frowned. She said, yeah, of course. I have cancer. She'd been wearing a bandana, but it didn't ever occur to me. She changed the subject pretty quickly, finished the bowl and wished her well, and she left. I always think about how she is, especially now an old family friend has cancer and witnessing everything, hearing all fears, how stressed she is, but she just keeps going strong. That stranger was so strong. Story 27. There is one person I think about every now and then, and I have told this story before on Reddit. So I'm going to post it again here. So I was sitting at this nice little coffee place in Gdansk, Poland. I was 16 at the time, sitting by myself. I was getting some breakfast pretty early because I never sleep late in the morning, and I decided to eat while waiting the two hours for my family to get up. Anyways, I was sitting in the nice little coffee shop and all the tables were full. After a little while, this Korean guy walks in early 20s. I saw that he realized he had nowhere to sit and my table was pretty big, so I just waved and said, Hey, dude, grab a chair. He didn't understand what I meant at first, but then I gestured to the chair across from mine. He walked up to me, nodded his head as a thank you, and sat down. We didn't really talk. He flipped out his phone. I was reading a book while drinking some delicious lemonade I that didn't want to believe contained alcohol because my mother would terminate me. So anyways, my food arrives a little before his. He gets some sandwich, and I had chicken. This is where we started talking, well, sort of. He pointed at a cute redhead across the room and said quietly, 22, avid reader, recently dumped, has a cat, me. How could you tell? Him. Class here listed on her bag, it contains three books that aren't on any curriculum and she's been crying recently? Me. Ha! He then proceeded to analyze almost every person at that place and detail this information to me, which we then discussed and most of the time he sounded reasonable. At one point, I even got one of the waitresses to come over and answer a few things about herself just to see that this guy actually managed to read people accurately. We finished our meal playing this little game of figuring out who the people around us were. He finished and gets up to leave. I ask him, what do you do for a living? He turns around and smiles at me before he says, 
I live. He then walked out and I never saw him again. But it was awesome being doctor. Watson for a Korean Sherlock Holmes. I sometimes wonder what that guy's doing now. Story 28. This is the first thread that I've ever been able to share this story in. One time, while in the Miami International Airport, I was passing through customs and walked toward a young African-American security agent. While he was checking my bag, I experienced the greatest 10 seconds of conversation that I likely ever will in my life. Security agent. You have some liquids in here that I need to take out. Me. Nichols? Security agent? Ball? We stared at each other in utter confusion and simply parted ways without saying another word. It saddens me to think that I will never meet that man again. Story 29. At my high school graduation, there was this woman in her mid-thirties who seemed to be staring at my throughout the entire ceremony. I thought I was imagining it, or that she was staring at someone else. But afterward, in the darkened and crowded gym, I heard my name. I turned around and there she was. She told me, you don't know me, but I know you and I've been watching you for many years. I want you to know that we're very proud of you and all of your accomplishments. She listed some of them specifically. Then she walked off into the crowd, and I've never seen her again without even telling me her name. It was one of the strangest things that has ever happened to me. I have no idea who she could be or why she seemed to know so much about me. Story 30. I think of Kelsey, an elderly lady whom I had a single very dear experience. I think of her almost every time I muster the courage to talk to strangers. I met her when she was really low, obstinately drunk and in great pain, one day on my way to work. She and I were on the southbound 70 into San Francisco. I noted her because she was boisterous, skimpily dressed in foggy weather, and smelled of liquor and sadness which could be smelled across the rows of seats. I couldn't help but overhear her conversations with the bus driver, and as it turned out, she was going to my workplace, the Exploratorium, for afternoon activities. I did not say anything about my affiliation, because frankly she was intimidating unstable, going from laughter to tears at a moment's notice. However, once I got off the bus, I conquered my fear and told her I worked there. Without any more clarification, she immediately and somewhat alarmingly put her arm around my shoulder, but with a kindly smile that put me to ease. She spoke energetically, openly, and with drunken wisdom. We walked to a grassy field. This was when the Exploratorium was at the Palace of Fine Arts where she took off her flip-flocks and began to frolic, and I with her. We danced underneath a willow, which she explained excitedly could be cloned with its twigs. She cut off the twigs and gave them to me to propagate, which I accepted graciously. After that, we continued on to the museum arms interlinked and skipping like Dorothy down the yellow brick road. After a few moments of boy skipping, she broke down into tears on my shoulder. She opened up to me about how she had been laid off due to a back injury, and how she was being denied disability for stupid reasons, and how she had turned to drinking because she couldn't take painkillers. She proudly showed me pictures of her three kids and reminisced about many her successes and failures in life. She sobered when we saw some ducks. She got close to them on hands and knees, then began to quack to them with gusto. She told me to do the same, and she taught me their language for a good 10, 15 minutes. Finally, we arrived at the front gate, and I sensed her trepidation about the price of the tickets, so I said simply that I would get her in for free. All she would have to do is pretend to be my mom. So we walked in, arms linked and smiling gaily into the museum, and simply frolicked for 30 minutes or so until my shift came to begin work. At the end, in front of all my co-workers, this Kelsey gave me a big sloppy whiskey kiss on the cheek. I've never seen her since. Sometimes her memory is the only thing that can nudge me to talk to strangers, since it reminds me of the value of those spontaneous interactions. Story 31. Walking home late one night in my neighborhood, I passed a beautiful girl doing the same. I knew I should talk to her, so as we passed each other, I mumbled something like, Nice night for a walk. As she passed, she said something clever that I don't remember, not turning to say it. I immediately stopped, turned around, and replied. She did the same, and we walked towards each other. We proceeded to have a three or four minute conversation about our nights, and she threw out a line like, Well, I didn't find what I was looking for, yet. I completely missed the meaning of this, and rather than invite her to join me on a late-night adventure, casually bid her a good night. It wasn't until later I started tearing my hair out with what I had done. Never saw her again. Always reminds me to never hesitate. A rejection is never as bad as not knowing. Story 32. I lived in Nashville briefly and worked in an electronics store there. One day a customer comes in, older guy 50-sish, seemed to have a little attitude. He was acting tough the whole time. Short answers, not much input, decided to fudge. 
I'll take this one, I guess, piece of cow. The whole time I thought, screw this guy, the commission isn't worth it. Well, I start to check the guy out at the register, and he's writing a check. I notice his hand. It shakes. Shakes a lot. We make eye contact, and he says, Oh, no, doctors think something's wrong with me. The fudge they know. He hands me the check. Penmanship squabbly from the shaking. I asked if he needed help loading the TV, as was protocol, and he, of course, said, fudge, no. The man left. I knew he was dealing with the early stages of Parkinson. My father has been a sufferer for almost a decade. My heart went out to this guy. I felt so terrible for judging him for how he acted. This man was probably scared deep down, putting on the tough face. It really hit me hard. I really do think about this guy randomly and hope that he has gotten help like my father did. It really taught me not to judge people because you really have no idea what goes on in their lives. Story 33. During the premiere of the first Hobbit movie, I ended up going alone since none of my friends were around, interested. I stood in line next to and struck up a conversation with three people who were also going to see the movie. One of them was a grad student in linguistics, and we talked a bit about that. Another was in education, a teacher, I can't quite remember. But it was nice of them to sort of let me into their group for that short time. When the movie was over, we parted with joking promises to see you next year at the premiere of the second Hobbit movie. I'm pretty curious if I'll see them again or if they ever remember. Story 34. This was a few months ago. I was halfway through my third year of college and it had been a disappointing year. For whatever reasons, I had grown detached from my friends and spent most of my time alone in my room. There was even some drift with my roommates, who were my best friends from high school, because they had joined a fraternity and went out a lot while I isolated myself. I hadn't been speaking much with anyone, and as much as I didn't like that state of affairs, I wasn't doing anything to change it. One day I was walking to campus in the morning when I heard a voice call out. There was a guy on the other street and he was jaywalking over to me. I thought he was just going to ask for directions or something. Instead, he simply asked if I was also walking to school as well, and when I said yes, if he could walk with me and chat, Turns out he had recently decided that rather than walk in boredom by himself on his way to class multiple times a day, if he encountered anyone walking nearby, he would try to start a conversation. At first, we just talked about the usual questions, like what our majors were, what city were we from, etc. Somehow, that transitioned into talking about family and the future. We delved into some personal stuff like fears about parental expectations and cultural burdens, stuff I never even talked about with most of my friends. We talked for maybe 15 minutes at most before I got to my class, yet I felt so comfortable sharing myself with him. At the end, he told me that he's had a lot of interesting chats just like ours. Male, female, young or old, he'd heard a lot, and everyone always had a unique experience to share. He said a lot of the women he would talk with were surprised when he got to the end and didn't ask for their number, thinking he was hitting on them the whole time. No, he was in a happy relationship with his GF and really just wanted to talk. I'm a dude, but even I kind of wanted his contact information because I think we could have been good friends if we got to talk more. I can't even remember his name now. Was it Andrew? Tom? Andy? But that encounter sticks with me as an example of how to be outgoing. Sometimes you just have to put yourself out there. It might be uncomfortable at times, but what isn't? It still took me some time after that to take those principles to heart. But since then, I've joined some clubs, finally took the initiative to seek out a job, and rebonded with my roommates. I have a lot more friends that I talk to regularly now, am currently working at an amazing internship, and for the first time in a long while, I am completely happy with my life. Thank you, stranger. Story 35. I'm a guy, and I worked at a deli for about four years, and during my time working, there would always be customers that my manager would warn me about, oh, he stole a roll last time he was in, she takes forever to help, etc., this one time, an older customer comes in and my manager quietly pulls me aside and tells me, Listen, this guy is one of the angriest customers we've ever had. He complains about everything we do and he's yelled at a few workers. He's even tossed some food around. If you have any trouble, I'll finish his order. With this in mind, the guy approaches me and asks for a simple sandwich. I make it, ring him up, and hand it to him and tell him to have a good afternoon. He sat on the curb outside, ate it, and left zero issues. My boss was amazed. To our further amazement, an hour later, he comes in with a couple of flowers, hand them to me, and says, These are from my garden. Take them home and give them to your girlfriend or mother or someone. They'll really appreciate them. I said thank you. We both smiled at each other, and he left. To this day, I cannot explain why he took the actions he did, but I still remember that one customer after all these years. Story 36 
There was this guy who came into my workplace not ten minutes after I swore off guys for good. A very long and irrelevant story. It was also my last day and I was moving for a bit. Anyways, this guy starts talking to me. And he tells me about his family. And how he just moved to that city to be closer to his dad. And just so much about his life. Then we started joking. Finally, the time comes to give him his to-go order. And he shakes my hand and leaves. I left that job and that town for the summer. I moved back in with my family and I thought about him. I thought about him a lot that summer. I moved back. I still thought about him. Then I told myself that I was crazy for thinking about how nice and funny and cute that guy was because he's probably never going to walk into my life again. I get a new job, stay in more, then one day my friends coaxed me out of my little shelter and basically dragged me to a hotel so we can use their hot tub. My friend goes in to pay, and I recognize him. I asked, do you ever eat at House of China? He says, yeah, you're Laura, right? Two years later and we're still going strong. I love him more than anything, edit. Cox, not cola. Thanks for letting me know, guys. D, story 37. Not exactly a stranger, but this is a story I've never told another soul in my life. And it also does involve someone I'm fairly certain I'll never meet or see again in my life. If you've got a minute or two, sit back and relax, and enjoy a fairly angsty and childish story about me. Like many people now in their 20s, I was on MySpace in high school. I was also pretty short, chubby, and fairly socially awkward. I used MySpace to really help me in my awkwardness, as a tool to speak to absolute strangers. I used to love adding random people. Looking back, that was probably pretty sketchy. I remember adding this one girl, let's just call her B. B was from Virginia. If I remember right, I added her because of her taste in music. We instantly hit it off. It even got to the point of where it wasn't just MySpace. We would talk on the phone and text each other nonstop during the day. My friends started joking and called her my girlfriend. Oh, Dustin goes wild is texting his girlfriend B again. Who are you on the phone with, your girlfriend B? I always had a thing for B. And honestly, I think she really liked me too. She even dropped the sentimentally painful line of, if you lived here, we would definitely date. However, as kids, we knew we would never see each other. A really geeky thing we instantly clicked on was that we were both in the marching band, Sue Me. We would talk about it from time to time. Go forward two years from when we first started talking. I was a senior in high school. A little taller, a little skinnier, and a little older, but pretty much the same dorky band nerd. Over the time, communication between B and myself had broken off, and I had always hated that. This is relevant because we got a schedule of the band competitions we were going to. And as a favor to a friend, my band director had scheduled us to go on a seven-hour drive to Virginia. Was there really any way that girl would be there? Hell, Virginia is a pretty big place. I remembered the high school she was attending at the time. As we got in the parking lot, I scanned all of the other buses, and in the corner of my eye, I saw one belonging to her school. My heart was racing, man. See, she always brought up that the bus they used was different. It was a real dark red color, instead of the usual white or yellow charter buses. I instantly knew that she was there. The whole day, I was sweating bullets. A million questions were racing through my head. What would I do if I saw her? What would I say? Did she still even remember me? I must have looked so silly that day. Every time a girl walked by, I would give her a big of a stare, trying to decipher in my head if it was her or not. And of course, she showed up when I least expected it. I was one of the section leaders of my marching band. Real big honor, I know. We always had a meeting a few hours before our performance to get the rundown and make sure we were all on the right page. Things are going pretty normal. I'm talking with my friends about things like instruments, gloves, the usual stuff. That's when I hear it. Hi. It was faint, and honestly, any other day I would have missed it. I instantly knew it was the voice I had heard a million times over the phone during all those late nights. I must have snapped my neck with how fast I turned it around. There she was. My mouth felt like it was full of sand. I barely uttered a raspy hey in response. At that moment, we hugged each other and then sort of just looked at each other. Like a real awkward stare down for at least 30 seconds. Now that's only half a minute, but at that moment it felt like time had stopped. God, I wanted to kiss her so badly. Being the coward I was, though, I just stood there. After a little giggle, she waved by and went off to her friends. I was pretty busy the rest of the day and didn't see her again. That was the first and last time I ever saw B. Even now, four years later, I think about that encounter from time to time. I've dated other girls, and I'm sure she's gone on to date other guys, but I'll never forget her. Even though we never dated, she has a special place in my heart.